today I want to talk to you guys about the narrative of education in America. And now while this narrative has had many bright moments and has crafted many stories of success and triumph within the past few years, I particularly want to focus on the challenges that we face both as a country as a whole and on a local level, such as here in Austin. Along the way, we'll find ways that you and I can mitigate some of these challenges, and hopefully we'll be able to rewrite the narrative of America moving forward. But before I get into this narrative of red, white, and blue, I want to share with you guys the narrative of another country, the island of Mauritius. So by a show of hands, how many of you all have heard of the island of Mauritius prior to today? Okay, I see a couple. That's encouraging. Um, and if you haven't heard of Mauritius, I don't blame you. Mauritius is actually the country farthest from the city of Austin, Texas in the entire world. So we're actually on the opposite side of the globe, and Mauritius is right there off the coast of Madagascar. Now, growing up, this right here was where my father grew up, in the village of Lavinia. This is a photo I took a few years ago when I visited the town, and my father used to always share with me stories about growing up within that education system. Here he is with a bunch of his friends, and he's in the middle, obviously the guy not looking at the camera, um, but that's him. And he used to tell me stories that when he would wake up in the morning, he would race in line to see who can get the first bath amongst his brothers. And then he would go walk to school and see if he can grab a quick bite at the store. And when he would come home, when he would come home from, uh, from school, he would essentially go ahead and light a candle as the sun would set. Because oftentimes, families can afford to keep electricity running on throughout the night. Families and, and siblings and neighbors would share textbooks because they weren't always available and they weren't always provided by the school. And in other circumstances, people couldn't afford to buy textbooks all the time. So essentially, my father got the education of what you would expect from an island in the middle of nowhere. It was just enough to get by, and with the support of his friends and family, he was able to go ahead and leave the island in search of better opportunities. Since my father left, the narrative of Mauritius has taken a different tone shift. And in the past few years, we've started to see a lot more initiatives in crafting education to become a more high quality moving forward. And it got me thinking, how can I compare the experience of Mauritius in the past few years with that of the United States? So I ran some data, and I found something that was uplifting as a Mauritian, but very, very discouraging as an American. So what the graph will show you is that in terms of education spending year over year as a percent change, every single year Mauritius has increased education spending, whether it's by 1% or whether it's by 15%. But that can't be said um, in the narrative of the United States. There's actually a downward trajectory in the way that we spend in terms of education here in America, and it's very daunting. So to illustrate the gravity of the situation a little more, I did some more comparisons. So consider this. In the United States, the average student, uh, we spend around $10,000 to get this student um, in through, the, uh, through the education system. And alongside the student, you see a teacher. And the average teacher's salary in a K-12 role is around a little more than $40,000 per year. Here's a prison inmate. On average, the cost per inmate in the United States is also around $40,000 per inmate per year. Now, if that comparison doesn't irk you enough, here's a sea otter. And according to several zoo, uh, zoologists and several animal educators, they found that the average cost to maintain one sea otter in a zoo is around $30,000 because obviously we have to feed them restaurant-grade shellfish. And the last comparison is probably the most striking of all. We all know that in America, there's a huge emphasis that is being placed on defense spending. And in 2012, the average cost to keep one soldier abroad in Afghanistan was $850,000 per soldier per year. So let these comparisons kind of sink in. And what they say is that it's not necessarily a knock on those who serve and protect our country. It's nothing against sea otters or prison inmates. But what this does show you is that there's a clear discrepancy between the amount that we prioritize students the amount that we prioritize teachers and everything else. So we have to find a way to mitigate these problems. And I guess the first step is really defining the problem on two separate layers. Now, the first layer would effectively be layer one, obviously. And these are items that deal with very big ticket items. So these would be things such as infrastructure, teacher salary, classroom size, public policy. On a day-to-day -day level, you and I, unfortunately, cannot affect these items. As much as I would love to build a school to fix capacity concerns in Austin, I'm just a college student. I don't have the capital for that. I don't have the influence as much as I would like to have it. These are the items that we really put faith in the government on a federal, local, and state level to take care of. 
However, when you peel a little further in, you see that there's a second layer. And these are the items that address the question such as, does every student have enough books in the classroom to read? Does every teacher walk into the classroom every morning with enough supplies to get her through the day? Does every student have access to technology and to lab sets so that they can learn very interactively and very efficiently? These are just as impactful as the items on the left-hand side, except for these are the things that you and I can solve. A lot of these are a lot less co uh, costly than, than the items on the left. And at the center of all of this, in this layer, is the community. In the next few minutes, I want to talk about why the community is the best agent that is best positioned to bring about change in three main ways. So first of all, we've all heard the saying that it takes a village to raise a child. And for many of us, it's a very figurative uh, phrase. You know, I wrote a lot in my essays, you read it a lot on the articles, but for many of our parents, for many immigrants, such as my father, they understand this on a very literal level. And essentially, my father grew up in a village and he was raised by that village. And the reason the village is the most important unit in Mauritius is because they understand and they take ownership of those around them. That's the first reason as to why a community is best positioned. So when my father was growing up, and here's another picture of him with his, with his homeboys, and so essentially what happened was that he was raised um, with, with many voices around him. So when he would wake up in the morning, obviously you'd have a mother figure and a father figure to go ahead and you know, get them to wake up, eat some breakfast, you know, make them hustle outside to go to class. Then on the way back home, you know, sometimes some of the boys would want to grab a piece of uh, food to eat you know, from the bakery, local store clerk. And sometimes these, these store vendors would you know, let them have something on the house because they know these boys are hungry. When my father and his friends would go play soccer, there would always be an auntie or an uncle in the neighborhood that would come out of our house and start yelling at the kids, you know, stop playing soccer. Go ahead and start studying. And all these active roles in the community really help craft who my father is today. Now, the second reason as to why the community is the best agent to influence change is because at the end of the day, the community, so you and I, we understand our needs locally more than ever before. And that's because the following example. If I showed you this map, this map has a black circle around the center, and there's obviously a divide between the red region and the blue region. The regions represent economic segregation. And lo and behold, this is actually a map of Austin. The black circle is the, is, is the uh, University of Texas. And what this illustration shows you is that Austin is actually the most economically segregated city in the entire United States. But I bet that I didn't have to show you this map or tell you that fact for you to understand that. We all know that, you know, as students at the University of Texas, I've lived here for two years, and I already understand that Round Rock is doing fine, West Austin's alive and kicking it. You know, South Austin's doing well. But I also understand that East Austin is where all the development's happening, and it's where all the attention needs to be focused. However, what I notice, the intangibles that I see, aren't always going to be reflected in a budget. It's not going to be reflected on Capitol Hill. There's a lot of intricacies and a lot of agenda items that go into a budget that might not solve this problem. Therefore, it's up to you and I to understand the needs locally, and that's why we're best positioned to make some change. Now, the final item as to why change is very imminent and why we can go about bring, uh, bringing about this change is the fact that in 2016, there's a large surge of resource transparency. And let me give you an example of what that means. So back in the day, let's say maybe even 10 years ago, if I wanted to donate to the Boys and Girls Club of America, I would essentially write a check and I'd send it over to that, that organization and I wouldn't really see where that money goes. And that's, that's just how the nature of charity giving was back, you know, even 10, five years ago. However, nowadays, we're starting to see a lot of metric-oriented efforts, such as, you know, Kiva, Donor Shoes, all these organizations have become a lot more efficient, more transparent, and more readily available for communities to interact with them. So whether or not you're, you're an adult in the audience and you want to go ahead and give on a, on, a, on a financial level, you want to be able to go ahead and, and donate some money, you can use Kiva or Donors Choose, which is a crowdfunding, crowdfunding platform, and fulfill what you exactly want to int uh, intend to donate. If you're a student like myself and we, don't, and we live on a college budget, then you can go ahead and volunteer with Capital Community, or you can volunteer with Best Buddies and donate your time rather than your money to go ahead and bring about change. So at the end of the day, we see that there's three principal reasons. The first one is that we take on ownership, and we get this, what's called the warm glow effect. 
And it was a term coined by James Andrioni in 1989, which essentially talks about how when you take responsibility of something, when you take agency of something, that's where you get your gratification from. It's like rolling your own dice in Monopoly. I'm not gonna let anybody else roll my dice because it's my dice and it's my turn. And I get this effect of rolling my own dice and taking ownership. That's exactly the village mentality. The second item, as we discussed before, was the fact that we understand the needs more than ever before. We understand exactly which streets of Austin and which, which crevices and which corners need the most attention, and we understand things that don't go into budgeting, that don't go into a lot of the policy items that the government takes care of. At the end of the day, we're responsible for our own streets. And last but not least, there's a surge of resource transparency, and there's resources that are available to us, and it's just really up to us if we want to go ahead and take action or not. And research says that when you start taking action, you get a lot of good successful results. So this is the results of a few, few numbers from DonorsChoose.org, which is a very successful platform in donating uh, money to a lot of children and teachers in need. And as you can see, you know, we can go line by line with these items here and there, but the most important few numbers, as I kind of draw your attention back, is really the fact that we are a nation of around 300 million people, 50 million of which are students in the K through 12 programs. However, maybe, just maybe, we can take a few pages out of the book of an island of a little over a million. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a village mentality to build a community. So I challenge all of you here today to be the village and to make the difference. Thank you. <laughs>